the gentleman from California, Mr. Desaunye, who is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank the witnesses um, for your public service uh, and your dedication to learning and um, correcting some of the mistakes that were made. Director uh, Ray, I want to speak specifically, and uh, Congressman Welch did this a little bit, uh, Congressman Biggs and maybe others, about the activity on social media um, and what you've learned from that, what you might do differently, and what you have done differently. Um, I know on January 5th, walking up on the Capitol uh, without having this kind of information uh, about what was happening on Parler and others, that I was very concerned just seeing the people who were up there. And I'm not a professional law enforcement official like yourself. So on Parler, um, there was discussion about how to get weapons into DC. There were maps of the tunnels of the Capitol uh, complex. Um, clearly, they were being very direct on the Donald.win. Uh, there was detailed plans, not just to travel to DC, but where to stay, discussions on guns, semiotic weapons, uh, ties uh, to use against members and others, I assume. So in previous testimony, Director Ray, you have said um, that it's hard to distinguish between aspirational versus being intentional. But recognizing this is difficult territory and how unusual this was, the former president, in my view, clearly encouraging, directing, and inciting uh, this group of people, how they get information. But just the sheer volume, wouldn't the risk assessment have gotten to a point that you personally would have taken more action in hindsight? Certainly, Congressman, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, we, we believe strongly that what happened on January 6th was unacceptable, and we're determined to figure out how we can do even better, do things differently, do better at collecting, analyzing, and disseminating intelligence. You mentioned social media. You're absolutely right that social media is one of the biggest challenges we face in law enforcement. Um, the volume of it, you know, I sometimes say that terrorism today moves at the speed of social media. Uh, and you're talking about lots of chatter. There's all kinds of just unspeakably horrific rhetoric out there across the spectrum and trying to figure out which individuals are just using uh, hateful, horrible language with no intent to act versus which ones actually have an intention to commit violence, especially in a country where we have the First Amendment and there are all kinds of policies that the Justice Department has had in place for years and years and years that govern our, our uh, safe space or our ability to operate in social media is a real challenge. Among the things that we've taken away from, from this experience are a few. One, uh, as you heard me say in response to an earlier question, we need to develop better human sources, right? Because if we can get better human sources, then we can better separate the wheat from the chaff in social media. Two, we need better data analytics. Uh, the volume, as you said, the volume of this stuff is, uh, is just massive. And the ability to have the right tools uh, to get through it and sift through it in a way that is, um, again, separating the wheat from the chaff is key. And then the third, point that I would make uh, is we are, are rapidly having to contend with the issue of encryption. So what I mean by that is, yes, there might be chatter on social media, but then what we have found, and this is, is true in relation to January 6th in spades, but it was also true over the summer in some of the violence that occurred there, individuals will switch over to encrypted platforms for the really significant, really revealing communications. And so we've got to figure out a way to get into those communications, or we're going to be constantly playing catch up in our effort to separate, as I said, the wheat from the chaff and social media. So this is one of the biggest challenges when I talk with my counterparts in law enforcement across the country, and to some extent, even just around the world, we're all struggling with this issue right now. Uh, and it's, it's continuing to become a bigger and bigger problem for us. I want to um, give you an opportunity to respond to the previous uh, member, but in the context of we're getting more and more information about uh, the Department of Justice and specifically the FBI that doesn't speak well to the integrity frequently and the independence of the FBI. So you were responding, um, I think, appropriately, 
given your dedication and the people you manage and have worked with. So this is a real problem as well. How do we keep the Department of Justice independent, uh, filled with integrity and the FBI, given the pressures that we've seen by the previous administration? Uh, sir, every day I'm struck by just incredible acts of courage and professionalism and integrity by our people. And I think that is what I see as well across the country. That is probably why over the last two years, each year, the number of people all across the country applying to be special agents of the FBI has tripled, tripled what it was the first year or two when I started in this job. And it's about the highest it's been in about a decade. Uh, and this at a time when law enforcement across the country is having a real challenge recruiting. And I think that speaks volumes about what Americans in every district represented okay, by this committee think of the FBI. That, that is uh, wonderful news, very positive news. The gentleman's time is expired. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocate for the superiority of the white race. That is an absolute flat out lie. It is not our greatest threat. Not once in his speech today did Merrick Garland mention last summer's BLM riots or skyrocketing crime on our streets, the riots we still see week in and week out. How about Merrick Garland? You condemn this man on your screen, Justin Tyran Roberts, arrested for shooting five people in a 20 hour shooting spree in Georgia over the weekend. You know why he did it according to investigators? They insist. He was intentionally targeting white, military-looking men. That sounds racially motivated to me. He didn't mention that. No mention of this black-on-white crime because it doesn't fit their divisive narrative. These are stories that are actually happening in America. How about we stop issuing fake warnings about crime based off of political agendas and start prosecuting all criminals no matter what color they are? When you're up there, are you just getting tired of being told you're a racist, I'm a racist, everybody watching is a racist? Yeah. They have to talk about January 6th, and they have to talk about things that divide us on, uh, along racial grounds. It is, it is so wrong, but that's who the Democrats are today. They're this radical left-wing party, and they have nothing else positive to talk about, so they have to go here. You know, you look at January 6th, everybody has said it was a tragic day, it never should have yep. happened, they wanted people that were violent and destructive put away. But you know, I was looking at Senator Ron Johnson, he looked at hours and hours and hours of tapes and he was like something like 40% of the people were just let in by Capitol Police. But they don't talk about any of that and you have SWAT teams showing up in California at somebody's house trying to rouse them out of the house for walking around taking selfies inside that Capitol. It isn't right, Congressman. Or how about the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol? I mean, look, you're right. We Republicans have been, conservatives have been consistent. We condemned the violence that took place on January 6th, and we condemned all of it that took place all last summer with all these, uh, in all these metropolitan areas around our, around our great country. The Democrats are the ones who have been hip hypocrites on this. They did, they, last summer was fine. That was a righteous cause. But then they focused on, on January 6th. But the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol, the FBI kicks in their door, holds them at gunpoint, handcuffs them, interrogates them for four hours. They got the wrong couple. And then they take their phones, their laptop, and their pocket-sized copy of the Constitution. Talk about, I mean, that, that, there's got to be irony in that, that, that fact alone. So, yeah, the, where's the consistency that we would like from everyone? We've been consistent. I wish the Democrats would do the same. Yeah. Well, there's my pocket constitution. I carry it with me all over the place. <laughs> and I'm in Texas, Congressman. Come and take it. Usually we're talking about guns. This time I'm talking about my constitution. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocate for the superiority of the white race. Garland did not provide any numbers or statistics to back up this claim, but pointed to past racially motivated shootings and attacks, as well as the January 6th riot on Capitol Hill. 
Noticeably, Garland spent his entire 26-minute speech without even mentioning the summer of riots one time, simply ignoring months of attacks on police and federal buildings in cities all across this country as if it just didn't happen. Steve, I think this shows how politicized Biden's DOJ has really become ignoring vi radical violent groups like Antifa, like BLM, simply because they support the left-wing agenda. Yeah, unfortunately, it's another example of two sets of rules or two sets of narratives, really, in a way. And the narrative being spread here, of course, is that January 6th is, uh, was a, a riot that somehow endangered the American Republic, which is not in any sense true. It was an unarmed riot, inexcusable for, to be sure, but unarmed. No, not one person has been charged with having a firearm inside the Capitol that day, and it lasted a few hours. To try to compare that to weeks of rage and carnage up, across the summer last year in 2020 um, is just totally ludicrous and illogical. Unfortunately, that's right where Merrick Garland went. They're essentially pitting Americans against one another by labeling it via basically a race war, which is essentially what they're implying with that statement. I don't agree with it. I think it's absolutely horrifying to see that you have the DOG, DOJ essentially being weaponized against the American people. There was, a, there was a rally in Chicago of white supremacists on January 25th, and they put out a national call and they got 80 people to show up in Chicago. And according to one expert, five people were from the Chicago area. Out of about, what, eight or nine million people who live in Chicago, there were five people. Right. And so a lot of this uh, the southern, the, relies on the Southern Poverty Law Center and the statistics that they put out and the media regurgitate that. And so I think we have to be careful. Certainly, I, I do not trust the media uh, on this issue because they, they have proven themselves to be, uh, you know, not reliable when it comes to being partisan and pushing certain narratives. So um, is white supremacy, it, is there some in the United States? Absolutely. Is it the most uh, biggest threat to, to America? I think that's overblown, and I think that the administration is pushing it for their own political reasons. You know, it seems to me that race relations in America in recent decades have improved so dramatically that things like, for example, interracial marriages are totally unremarkable in America today. Uh, and it is not considered acceptable in polite society at all to have racist views. And yet we have people like Garland and Joe Biden who want to insist that the country is systemically racist. Are they essentially protesting a struggle that has already been won in American culture? You know, there has been tremendous progress in this country. And, and for a lot of folks uh, on the left to, to, as they're saying now, this is, you know, voting rights, it's Jim Crow 2.0, that there's been no progress made since the 1960s or even the 1860s. I mean, that is, most Americans understand that's ludicrous. I mean, that is gaslighting, right? That is an absolute gaslighting right. of the American people. And so I think, uh, again, in our normal everyday lives, we do not see the bogeymen that are being made out. There are not Klansmen walking around the corner. There are not white supremacists uh, gathering on street corners. And so I think, uh, you know, that ultimately falls flat to the American people because that's not what we see and we live in our day to day lives. Right. And we understand that racism is really, uh, you know, has has been a thing of the past. I mean, does it still exist today? Sure, it does in certain areas. But is the is the country systemically racist and oppressive? I don't think most people believe that.